Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Socialistics Podcast, Social Media Agency Stories. Really excited today to uh, to talk to a, a colleague, somebody that uh, probably has experienced a lot of the same things that I have, and hopefully some things I haven't, so that I can pick up a few things. But uh, let's uh, let's dive right in. Steve Brown from ROI Online. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here, Jason. You know, is it okay if we kind of cry or as we share? Of course. Personal experience. I don't know that, that I, we, yeah. I, I don't know that I have tear ducts. My wife says I don't have tear ducts because uh, that doesn't happen <laughs> often. But uh, you know, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's. Uh, you know, let's. Uh, who are you? Tell me a little bit about your background, your history, what you're doing, all that good stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I've always been kind of pigeonholed in a business development position and sales, and I've worked for several companies and helped them grow their market share. And the last company that I ended up with was a web design firm. And bef- it happened to be the web design firm that I was w- working for was the web design firm that I took like two companies that I'd worked for previously to them to redo their websites. And as a salesperson, I had this time to um, invest on my own initiative to updating the website just because I thought, you know, it'd be smart to help the company become more modern. But what I started to realize was that I was supposed to go out and knock on doors, cold call, just barge in and expect people I interrupt to help me make my quota. And that's, you know, maybe one out of 10 you can you can uh, get someone to sign up. But what I, what I started noticing is on these websites that I updated, like t- two out of three submissions of people asking you to come see them and talk about what you have to offer them, they would close. Mm-hmm. And I was realizing, wow, this is cool. So then I ended up at this web design firm and I was seeing all these other business owners and I'd been in their shoes and here they were coming and they were having this expectation. They knew inside innately they needed to upgrade their presence online, but they didn't have the exact words. And then I would hand it off to development and it would crash. And they would like look at me, the people that had trusted me and I'd built a relationship. They would look at me to try to help them pull out of the ditch and I wasn't in charge. And it was really frustrating. So I decided if I'm so smart and I think I could run this business so much better than maybe I ought to put my money where my mouth is and step out and do it. And I did. And uh, that, so that's how ROI online got started. How long ago was that? And uh, tell us a little bit about what, uh, what you guys do. Yeah. So that was about, it'd be nine years oh, wow. at the um, end of this month. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so what we do is I like to say it like this. We are the Chip and Joanna Gaines of getting your presence online, flipping your presence online. You know, you watch Chip and Joanna Gaines, a fixer-upper show, mm-hmm. and you think about the stage in life that those people, the, the husband and wife are in, they're sitting around talking to each other. This is not in the show, but you know this conversation happened. It's like, mm-hmm. honey, I don't think I want to... Um, on this next house to do all the remodel and us live in a construction zone for three or four years. And then, then me look at all the things I did wrong or have to fix the things I didn't do the right time. Cause it's not what I do all the time. So why don't we do this? Why don't we hire some people that actually know what they're doing and come in and get it done right. So we can enjoy our life in this and the kids can have their soccer team over or we can have people over and we're not eating in a construction zone. And, and so the folks that come to us, they're in that stage. They're finally at that point where they're going, Hey, you know, we're getting ready to scale. And I think we need to really get our act together online. We've got good business and good employees and good customers and good products and services, but we need to really get our act together here. So we'll take them. And we'll do the same thing Chip and Joanna Gaines does. We'll flip their house, set up their, you know, get their website messaging set up, get a nice national quality look and feel, set it up in some marketing automation, help them tee up a CRM, and then design one strategic campaign. Mm -hmm. And so we call that a flip or what we call a quick start. Mm -hmm. And then from there, if we're a good fit, we keep going. What, uh, what makes a perfect client for you? What do they look like? What's the, what's the persona of a perfect client for ROI marketing? Yeah. So at first I was thinking, you know, we got a couple of 
law firms. I, okay, I guess we're specializing in law firms. And then it was plastic surgeons. And, but then I would run in the next one and they would be like the worst client or like, we don't want this one. What I realized was it's a progressive minded business leader that's starting to go, I really need to be, all my customers are being trained to expect a good experience online. And I expect that of my brands that I go to, I need to walk the walk. And that's who we really gel with. They really yeah. have the proper expectations of that we're actually building an asset that's going to grow the value of their business. No, I love that. I, I get asked that question and I answer similarly, albeit in a, a little bit different way in that, you know, what are my red flags when I'm having that initial conversation with a prospect? And one of the big ones is if I feel like I'm in a situation where I'm having to sell them conceptually yeah. on marketing, right. like they either had, have had really bad experiences or they just think that marketing is a waste of money and like, I just, I walk away from those situations because even if I can flip them, even if I can get them to like, at least consider going down a path with us, I know that their expectations are going to be unrealistic. They're going to want their world to be, you know, you know, flipped, you know, positively in a month. And it just, it's never, ever, ever ends well. So I can Agreed. definitely relate to, um, you know, wanting to work with folks that um, don't have to be sold on that. And um are really, they're, they're more excited about the opportunity than having to be convinced about it. Exactly. If you have to convince them, you yeah. want your competitor to take those guys. Oh yeah, no, mm -hmm. for sure. So you've been around for nine years. Uh, that's about six more than we have. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say yeah, you've experienced uh, quite a bit more than we have over that timeline. But tell me a little bit more about, you know, I'm kind of curious about your team and are, are you a virtual? Do you have an office? Obviously right now things might be different regardless, but tell me a little bit about the makeup of your, of your business and your team and, and how you deliver what you do. Yeah. So obviously my, what we looked at in the beginning is different than what we look now as far as a team in many ways. So at first, you know, you're, when you're starting out and you're starting to figure out what you're really good at and, and you start to gel, you, you know, you're going to change and evolve and upgrade and, and gain from insights. But, you know, my original team was someone that was good at coding mm -hmm. and designing websites. Um, someone that had, um, you know, an inclination towards SEO. And then when I started hiring um, students out of the university, marketing students, mm -hmm. they would come and spend a little time we'd maybe do an internship and then if they were kind of a good fit, we'd, we'd go ahead and start giving them more assignments or more responsibilities. And so I was, I was develop, developing a team from scratch because what we do, and you probably relate, people just don't come out of school ready to go with this. So, I mean, we're doing street smart marketing more than internet marketing or whatever the teaching in the university and, and, and plus, whatever they learned, even if they learned it three months ago, it's different now. The tools have changed or a trend has changed or some aspect of it. And so they have to be very open-minded to figuring it out and doing research and testing things. So, um, you know, and we grew, our team grew over the years to where we had, we were coming up on 17, 18 people. Mm. And so I had, the core team at was pretty much headquarters. They came in every day. They worked here. They were local. And then I had higher level talent. And when I say higher level talent, it's talent that is really good at managing business owners, relating with them. You know, they've got some business expertise or they worked for a while. And so they're, they're not as thrown off by the, the, you know, very insistent nature of a business owner, right? Mm -hmm. And so I started to, these were more remote folks that were very valuable. The time that we uh, applied their expertise, they were really good. They moved the needle. And then the headquarters teams were like, became more and more the support crew to the, you know, the management of the clients. Now we're, we're you know, since we've had this event and, 
and had to kind of pull back. I've had lost some great clients. I had one client just decimated in the oil and gas service industry. You know, they were responsible for a big monthly retainer yeah. and they had 250 employees and now they're like a skeleton. Maybe they have 25 employees, but they had to just start slashing and we were one of the, the I don't want to say victims, but we were one of the casualties of that. Yeah. How how had how has the business business been um, since you know the pandemic kind of hit? Are you, have you kind of did you go down? Did you come back up? Has it been consistent? Just kind of curious what you're experiencing with it. Well, first overall. we had we had uh, some attrition from accounts, yeah. and then folks that were teeing up and getting ready to pull the trigger pull back, and so you know I don't have the story of oh it's the best time in in our you know, agency. I don't right. have that story. I have that. We've gotten a couple of new accounts. I'm really proud of them, but it's people are really, they're hesitant to pull the trigger on doing this until they know, you know, what's need to feel a little bit better about the future. We need to wait three, four or five more months. And I've just been encountering that. Yeah. People are interested. People are shopping. People are convinced they need to get their act together, especially online. Now, mm -hmm. I mean, who would have thought that if, if I would have called you, Jason, like last December, and said, I hope you had a good year, but, but let me just tell you, no one's going to want to shake your hand. No yeah. one's going to want to come in your agency. You can't go out and meet them at a coffee shop. Yeah. Who would have thought I was crazy, but that's no. what we're dealing with. No, it's crazy times. Nobody could have ever predicted this and, it's definitely going to change the world no matter um, what happens. You know, even when we get back to normal, it's going to be a new normal. So we, we started as a virtual agency, so we kind of had a little bit of a head start. So it didn't really impact us logistically too much. We certainly had some attrition similar to you. Um, I found, though, in the past month or two, things have really picked up considerably because I feel like um, businesses are realizing that either, A, this thing, you know, we're, we're going to be dealing with this for – a longer period of time than maybe we anticipated and we can't just stop, you know, marketing ourselves. You know, right. we have to figure out a way to have a, a stronger digital uh, footprint. And mm -hmm. I think it's that. And, and even if it's not that it's even when things go back to normal, that's going to be a different kind of normal because people have gotten so accustomed to working from home. I think a lot of companies are going to shift a lot of their work space or work um, their workforce home. Um, people are going to demand it. And people that, that generally means people are going to be online even more than they already were. So I think businesses realize, well, if we haven't been serious about our online strategies, we, we better get pretty serious about it now. So um, that's my guess. That's, you know, so it's, it's really started to, to pick up uh, uh, of recently. So um, what, uh, how do you, um, what's your top, ways of getting new business? Like what, what are the things that you guys are doing that's keeping um, leads coming in? Well, it, for a while, so we were one of the original agencies certified by StoryBrand. And if you're not familiar with StoryBrand, it's a company out of Nashville and Donald Miller, he's um, an author and he wrote a really good book called Building a Story Brand. Mm -hmm. And it's how to really uh, nail your messaging really is he offers a framework so a great book i highly recommend it but um so i went out to a couple of workshops there and we got certified as an agency and that was like one of the best things i i had done because most of my businesses my business comes to me via referrals but when i got involved in that then all of a sudden you had all these people reading the book getting convinced about it going into the workshop and he would do a great job convincing them that this framework is a great way to do it. But then they would go home and go, Oh, this is harder than we thought we need to hire someone to help us. Yeah. So we were getting great leads, but over time he brought on like 500 other guides onto that, that list. And so our lead flow had dropped significantly, but I, you know, in a move to diversify my lead acquisition and noticing how people that came to us from reading that book were so more aligned with our agency, I 
it pushed me over the hump because in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, I need to write a book. I need to write a book. Mm. But what am I going to write a book about? And then that was like the trigger is going, oh, okay. So people that do read my book, they'll be more aligned and buy into our philosophy and the way that we go about it. And what I was noticing, Jason, is that people would come to us convinced about getting their messaging clear. And it was assumed that they had the fundamentals in place. But the truth is, as you get going along, people would go, well, I just don't think this is working. You know, they'd they, be happy for a while, but then they come back and go, I just don't think this is working. I realized that I assumed they had a great sales process in place and that the leads that were coming in from the website and the, the marketing efforts were being handled and, you know, brought in house and sold, but that wasn't the case. And so I really recognized that the fundamentals even though I assumed they were in place, they got it. We were saying, I say marketing, you say marketing, but you know, you see a, a yellow sponge and I see a squid and we weren't seeing the same things, even though we were saying the same things. So that's, that was where I got the conviction why I needed to write my book and, ex and make the case. Let's make sure you have your fundamentals in place. These are evergreen business, legitimate business business processes that investing in it will continue to return value to you on into the future, even as marketing changes. Yeah. So I've, I've always thought about, so I've written, I've written a book, but fiction, nothing to do yeah. with marketing, more of a passion <laughs> project, uh, bucket list, check mark. But I've thought about that. I've thought about, man, I, I know the, uh, that that could probably be a really great business development tool, but, uh, Decided to start with the podcast first, a little lower lower barrier to entry, and Smart. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's that's great to hear um, that that works. And speaking of things that works, I think one of the questions I I, I think would be really uh, beneficial to those either starting an agency or thinking about it, like what are the top one, two, three things that come to mind for you if you were if you were advising somebody that's thinking about starting a marketing agency. What if you could only give them a, a handful, a couple things of like tips or things that they absolutely have to be considering or thinking about? What are the things that kind of jumped to mind for you? Yeah, one of my biggest lessons was defining the kind of clients that we were best for. Mm -hmm. There's a point in your early survival, you just want to make payroll, you want to get to the next month. You know, it's I call it the survivor man. Um, dilemma and that you, you watch that show survivor man where they dump this guy out and he just needs to make it a week mm -hmm. okay so they drop him off with you know with um i don't know a knife and and maybe a little whatever and he just needs to find a little shelter find some water and he can fast the rest of the week if he has to and, and not freeze to death and then they pick him up in a helicopter and he's fine and he does another episode yeah. But and it just hit me that you know, and when you start off your your business, you're kind of that way. You just want to make it month by month, and but imagine if they dropped him off and they said, "We're not going to pick you up for a year." Yeah. Well, he would approach that week way different, right? Mm -hmm. He'd have to start going. I need to find a place of really good shelter. So what I'm saying is, you need to start approaching and setting up systems and business processes. There's a great quote in a book by Scott Adams. It's called How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Bigly. But he says, goals are for losers, systems are for winners. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we can set the goal, but we have to have a system in place to get to that goal. No. It's the same thing in business. So to start seeing systems, designing systems. It's a way to create, start to create a culture where you can hire people and they adopt your system and they become more impactful, more yeah. faster. The culture is really important. You need to have a very defined uh, vision of where you want to be in three years. There's a great book by Cameron Harold, and it's called um, um, Vivid Vision. And basically you draw a picture in words of what your agency looks like in three years. And then 
So think about the people you hire. They come on and let's assume they all have the best intent and really want to help you run a successful agency. But if you ask them where we're all going, even though you've said it a couple of times or you said it to me, they're all rowing to different parts of the to their horizon. They're not mm-hmm. going to end up in the same point. Defining that vision helps align their energies and and also you know, to understand what you're about and why you're doing it. So it repels people that is not going to be a good fit and attracts people that will be a good fit. Yeah. No, I love that. I, uh, we established our core values. Um, not right away. I think so, we, part of it was just um, figuring ourselves out. I think in the beginning, you know, you know what we wanted to be, what I, what I wanted to build. And uh, it really does make such a huge difference in helping you navigate the people that you take on and making sure that they're a good fit. Cause you know, I, One of my big, I I love, I mean, I went through the gauntlet at Microsoft in terms of being trained on how to interview and hire. So I'm lucky to have had that opportunity. Um, It's, it's so expensive to um, have to replace people. And I take a lot of pride and put in a lot of effort in making sure that who I hire has the, the, uh, the biggest amount of upside in terms of sticking around a long time, because I feel like an agency's ability to be profitable and successful is so reliant on having incredible people that can, you know, I always say hire great people and get, you know, get the F out of the way, let them do their thing. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you're constantly having to churn and burn people, it's, that's like, that's an agency. It's any, it's any business is killer, especially agencies and especially in a virtual environment where it gets even more difficult to foster, um, a culture because you're not seeing each other every day. You're not in the same room every day, you know, especially right now. I think, I think a lot of agencies, if they weren't already thinking about going virtual, this is probably pushing them in that direction because they're realizing, hey, maybe this can work. Oh, wow, we save a lot of money. Um, so I, I predict that this whole situation is really going to, uh, I think the combination of newer agencies already setting themselves up that way and then traditional ones taking a hard look at maybe we need to start doing that as well. So it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see how that dynamic works out uh, with, with agencies trying to deal with that. Totally, I agree with that. And so it makes that even more, more important to really define, you know, what you're about and why you, you do what you do. Yeah. And it helps your clients also understand you and align with you. Yeah. What, um, what do you love about what you do? And what, is, what do you hate? Maybe not hate, but, you know, what, what's, what's yeah. the best thing about being an agency owner and, and what that does for you? And, and what's the biggest stress? or anxiety that you feel about what you do? The most fulfilling thing is when you see a client, the light bulb go off on them about the asset you're helping them create that's going to grow the value of their business over time. Mm -hmm. You know, when they, there's a point in a, where a client's going to go at some point, I'm going to offload my business. And well, the other day I got this phone call. And this is a great example. He came to town from Colorado. I'm we're in Texas. He came to town from Colorado and he's was going to start doing garage doors. And so he didn't go get a building on a busy street and land and trucks and billboards. He he came over here and we got him an online presence and started helping him that way. He ran his business for four or five years out of his garage, if you will. But he calls me the other day and he says, Steve, I've got these guys that are considering buying my, my business now, you know, what, what kind of price should I put on this website? It's worth something, isn't it? And I said, well, here's the way I would determine it. It's like, so how many leads or business inquiries do you get a week? from your website he said well one a day on average and i said so what's the lifetime value of a new client for you over the course of four or five years they're going to come back to you they're not just going to do one repair and so he goes okay and then multiply that out so if you've got 350 days in a year let's just say you get 300 leads and you close just one third of those times the lifetime value of your average client, 
that's what you're about to hand off to this guy. Because mm-hmm. in the back of this guy's mind is, all right, I'm going to pay for this business, but how am I, how am I going to pay for it? And I, you can show him, look, I've got this virtual machine that hands you opportunities every day. Then that can give me clarity on how I'm going to pay off whatever you're asking for. So that just boosted the value of what we had helped him implement. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. But that's fulfilling to me because we do that. And we probably, Jason, we probably don't really know how well we've impacted that business, not just on leads, but on like attracting good employees. Maybe you maybe attracting partners who knows where that goes a lot of it's unmeasured yeah i think a lot of uh we're pretty big on reporting and analytics being transparent about what we do and trying to you know communicate the value of of what we do and i've i've been down that road with other businesses where it's difficult because they they don't a lot of times they don't want to do anything and they they don't put the systems in place to truly position themselves to understand where and how they get new business. So um, oftentimes it's a challenge to be able to, I mean, cause a lot of businesses, you know, if you know, people pick up the phone still, you know, there are things that aren't necessarily immediately trackable. So that's always been a frustrating thing. We've worked with, um, you know, home healthcare businesses. And I remember working with one client who was spending, you know, a couple thousand dollars on, you know, ads, social search. And I could see that they're getting inquiries. They're getting calls, right? You know, I could see call tracking reports. I can see the length of these calls. And, uh, you know, they were like, yeah, we're, we're only, they, you know, he would come back and say, well, we're only getting, you know, maybe one or, new, one or two clients or only, you know, five people called that found us online. I'm like, well, are you sure your people are asking the right questions? Like, yeah. and they're like, oh yeah, absolutely. So I did a little, you know, uh, secret shopping and sure yep. enough, they're not. No, they're not. So, you know, businesses have to, you know, they have to have some skin in the game, you know, to be able to make their marketing be successful. Those are the best clients for us are the ones that do want to be somewhat of an active participant. So I can definitely relate to that. Um, you asked what the stressful part is. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? That's the, you know, for me, for me, it's like the stressful parts when, when a fire pops up, having to come in and, and be the fireman and put out that fire. Now with really good people, it doesn't happen that often. Mm-hmm. And usually the, where the responsibility lies in that is in the sales process. And I'm the one that d- does those. And I didn't vet that person well enough. And so you think about, you get an account. Yeah, you got a new account, but you just brought, if it's a bad account, you brought in an extra stress, frustration, uh, pushback, diminishing of your team's abilities. You know, you just, you can really damage the camaraderie and the, the morale with just a real crappy client. Mm-hmm. And I try, but every once in a while, I still make a, a bad call. Mm-hmm. And it, it's stressful and it's costly. Yeah. That, so timely comment. I, our last episode uh, that, we, uh, that I put out was called The Power of No, which was basically mm-hmm. around uh, getting comfortable and learning how to say no to new opportunities. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're starting out. And you're, like you said, you, you talked about how, you know, making payroll every month and it can be hard to walk away from money, period. And, yeah. uh, but it's one of the best things that we ever did is just being more, so having, not only being selective, but approaching new opportunities with that mindset that, um, and, I, and I've been open and honest with, you know, when I have those exploratory calls with folks, they say, I, I tell them like, we, we, we say no as much as we say yes. And, and here's why we need to make sure it's a good fit. And. I feel like businesses really like to hear that. I think then it, it, it almost puts them at ease uh, a little bit because they feel like, oh, well, you know, they're, I'm not, this isn't going to be a hard sell here, you know, because a, a lot of, a lot of people have been, had bad marketing experiences. I mean, all of them. Yeah. Half, half of what I do is cleaning up other messes, Seriously. you know, having to kind of talk them through, 
you know, you know, well, we did this and it didn't work. And I'm like, well, it was because of this and this. And so it's, there's a lot of trust building. There's a lot of, you know, you got a lot of education. So um, it's, it's, it is a marathon uh, for sure when it comes to landing new business in, in many cases, because, you know, most businesses, it's not like that's their first rodeo with marketing. It's just, you know, they've, they've, chances are they've had a bad experience. And unfortunately, you're, if you're the person that they're taught, like you're going to have to deal with that to a certain extent in some capacity. Yeah, that's that, you know, what I learned is, and here's the other part, you have to be a little courageous when think about saying no is like, I'm really going to narrow the number of really good um, leads. You know, I'm going to, I get 10 leads, but really only three of them are going to be potentially legit. And then you're not going to get all of those, right? And so you need to be, you need to be okay with doing that and not, and me being a salesperson most of my life, there's this nagging thing of not winning everyone, mm -hmm. right? And so you can be kind of hard on yourself. And then you set up a system that's going to push them away. That really feels weird for a while. Yeah. Um. Before we wrap things up, I wanted to ask you one question that goes a little bit deeper. Tell me a little bit about um, what's the future for you, your business? Like, where do you want to see it go? And mm -hmm. what are the things that you're either working on or need to do to take it to that place? Yeah, so, so the book, my podcast, um, here's where I see things going is that there's a point in a in your business after a bit where you you go all right I'm running a good business I'm a good business owner but what's the next stage for you and that's to start becoming a mentor and that means that you're producing content to support like you're doing other agencies or business owners or whatever that is you need to start putting yourself out there and and require that of you of collecting your thoughts and getting them succinct and then starting to publish in some manner where you're giving to the community and it'll bring you other opportunities that maybe you didn't expect or that you couldn't have predicted maybe more business maybe you know speaking mentorship who knows what it's going to lead to so i in my efforts you, you produce a book but then you need to have a marketing strategy behind it you need to be producing content continually introducing people to it because just because you publish a book but on Amazon doesn't mean everybody's it's not flying off the shelves there are like I don't know 2,000 other books published mm -hmm. that same day yeah. so the that and then what I'm also been doing you know I tell my clients they need to start seeing themselves as a multimedia publishing house but but Steve we're a plastic surgery practice yeah but you're a multimedia publishing house first of all you're not a plastic surgeon you're a business person and now you need to start publishing content on a regular that's like crazy for them to hear or, or actually see themselves so what i've been doing is basically tricking them into becoming that and here we have a, we have all the equipment to do this and so what i started doing was i want to interview you mr physician mm -hmm. once a week and what we're going to do is have a conversation that's like a content pillar around whatever your strategic campaign is. We can produce lots of great content with just a 45-minute interview once a week and pull it out of your head so you don't need to think about how to write it or how to do the blog. Or We'll, we'll just pull it out. And now we got an audio layer, we have a video layer, and we have a text layer. on, mm -hmm. And that goes to the team push it out our publishing system and it's badass but well, what this is what happens first they show up with the little um, apple earbuds right and then then it's like they show up and they've got well, what kind of mic should i get steve i've got this yeti is that a good one yeah that's a blue yeti is a great one how's my lighting and now they're like can we bring someone in and interview them as well and then then uh, what's that tool you were talking about vidyard because now they're starting mm -hmm. to see where we're going and they start picking it up and running with it. And it's, so what did I do? 
I empowered them to start becoming a mentor and start producing great content because it's fulfilling to produce good content. To sit and have a conversation like this, you and me, and yeah. we're not being interrupted by our phones, by our kids, by by the waitress, you know, if we're at a pub and having a beer, it's cool because we're two, two nerds sitting here talking about something that we really can't talk to many people about. Yeah. No, I love that. I, uh, yeah, I mean, when I start, I met up just the podcasting thing has just been uh, a really interesting journey. I, I, I love doing it. I am, and people that don't know anything about the, the behind the scenes with it, they, they, look at it through a lens of similar to like TV, like, Oh my God, you have a podcast. I mean, how do you like, what is that? I mean, they're just, there's like a celebrity aura to it. Like yeah. we know it's not that di- like, you, you know, they spent 60, 70 bucks on my setup here. Yeah. And once I did a couple, I mean, it's not that difficult really to, to do it. I mean, you just have to want to and spend a little bit of time getting ramped up, but you know, the production value and the time and the effort is not as significant as people from the outside looking in think. Mm-hmm. So that's, that was the kind of thinking is like, now I'm on these calls or these, you know, with, with leads and trying to cultivate them. And they say something that triggers, Oh, I talked about that in this episode. Well, now I can follow up with an email. Hey, it was great talking to you. By the way, you yes. should listen to episode six of my podcast where we talked yeah. about this a little bit. And then they get there like, Oh my God, you have a podcast. Yeah. Differentiator, you know? Yes. And um, totally. so I, I can totally see how clients could stand to benefit in much the same way. Um, they just have to kind of be shown, you know, kind of, they just, they just got to get a taste of it. Right. And once they start doing it, they're like, Oh, this isn't so bad. This isn't so hard. I actually enjoy this. Yeah. So uh, that's impressive that you're able to get clients to do that. Uh, uh, we haven't personally gone down that road with them, but it's, it's, it's an interesting um, way to do things for sure. You should do it. I'm, they eventually love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they would. They just show up and you, you do the interview. Yeah. And this, this epiphany came from me. It's like my whole reason I started my agency was to help our clients produce blogs. Yeah. And it's like, so how do we do that? Well, we'd have to meet with them and ask them questions and then write the blogs and then get them to sign off on it. And then, yeah. you know, that process, you just do an interview, mm-hmm. push it out. There's yeah. no, they don't need to sign off on it. They were there. They right. said it. They said, it's right. beautiful. Exactly. No, I love it. No, that's great. Well, awesome. I loved uh, learning a little bit about what you do and with your business. Uh, it's always, um, I, I mean, I love talking to other agency owners just because obviously you can relate so much, but you know, hopefully there's some things in here that folks maybe are listening to that they could pull some, some thoughts or ideas from that, that might be helpful to them. But uh, where can, uh, tell people where they can find you. What are you doing? Where can they find you across the web? Yeah. So my book, I, I wrote it for agency owners and for business owners or marketing directors to help them get on the same page, say the same words, mean the same words, and see the same thing. So I, first of all, I encourage you to get that, the golden toilet, stop flushing your marketing budget into your website, build a system to grow your business. It's the funniest book on marketing. You're going to enjoy it. You can get it on Amazon. You can listen to it on Audible, Kindle. Um, the golden toilet.com is my website for the book. And then it's ROI online.com. Of course I'm on LinkedIn, Steve Brown, uh, surprise. There's more than one Steve Brown on LinkedIn. So it's <laughs> Steve Brown, ROI online and yeah, reach out. I'm totally, whatever I can help you as an agency owner, direct you, suggest resources, a great book, by the way, that really helped me. It's, um, it's called the Marketing Agency Blueprint, and it's by Paul Retzer. Hmm. Okay. I read it about about ten years ago, and I I roughly based my business model off of that book. It'll really help you with some shortcuts. Awesome! I'm gonna definitely check that one out. So, well, thanks, uh, thanks again for joining the show. I uh, really enjoyed having you, um, and I'll certainly be checking out all that stuff. Uh, that's it for this episode of Socialistics. Make sure you uh, like, review, share with your colleagues, and uh, check us out at uh, socialistics.com. Uh, thank you for listening, and we will catch you next time. <laughs>